Okay, we have eight o'clock in the morning. We will start here. Uh, good morning, uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm I'm very happy that Cosmos uh, Darwin, uh, senior program manager uh, from Redmond, and uh, I know Cosmos is doing a lot of stuff in Azure Stack HCI, but he will tell us about that very soon. Is doing this presentation with us uh, at a very unpleasant time for him. It's 11, uh, 11 p.m. in uh, Redmond, so uh, I'm very happy that we can do that. I will do only three slides before we switch to uh, Cosmos screen. So um, I want to announce the next webinar, and of course, Cosmos is presenting the stuff. Uh, we don't have to, I think you don't, you don't have too much demos, uh, maybe one demo. But I was thinking, so uh, in the next webinar, I will take the time to go through the new features and also demo demoing them. Uh, and we, the, um, the webinar will take place on Monday, the 14th of September at uh, 11 uh, a.m. German time. Uh, it will be in German, I think. So and then I want to uh, to uh, announce our next uh, S2D course, but now I'm pretty unsure if it should be S2D course or Azure Stack HCI course. We will also have a look in the in the power course in the new Azure Stack HCI uh, features. Um, and I'm now doing my courses as a hybrid course. So you can attend uh, in Hallenberg uh, in, the, in the training room, or you can attend via Teams or Zoom. That's uh, not quite fixed. I get all the tech, uh, technical stuff very soon. And I have a special, the next course is uh, end of September, so the 21st to the 25th of September. And I have a special for the webinar attendees. It's not 2,499 euros, it's 1,999. So if you are interested uh, uh, in uh, Storage Spaces Direct and Azure Stack HCI, send me a mail. And uh, um, Cosmos would like to have lots of questions. Uh, the presentation is in three parts and Cosmos and I agreed that after each part, he will handle questions to the part. So don't be shy. Um, uh, the, oh, uh, Marcus, uh, the date is not June. Did I? No, it's not June, it's uh, September. Yes, uh, it's uh, 21st of September. Thank you, Marcus. So don't be shy. Uh, ask your questions in the question part of uh, GoToWebinar. Uh, you can do it in German, uh, and I will translate them uh, if, if you don't want to type English. So without further ado, we will switch over to Cosmos screen. I hope that works. So yeah, Cosmos. thank you very much, Karsten. And um, let me know when you are able to see my screen. Yes, I see now your screen. Go on, Cosmos. The stage is yours. Terrific. OK, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Karsten, for setting up this event. This is a, a real good opportunity for us. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We have an incredible attendance. So I'm very grateful for everybody making the time early on a Friday morning. I know it's the end of the week. Uh, so thank you for your interest in Azure Stack HCI. Um, as Karsten said, we'll spend the next hour or so talking all about what's new for Azure Stack HCI. We actually have an incredible lineup of announcements. It's one of the most exciting times for Azure Stack HCI that I can remember. Our team uh, is is really, really excited these days about hyper-converged infrastructure. Um, and we'll we'll try to structure it in three sections. So there, you'll see there's a natural way of dividing the content into kind of a part one, part two, part three. And after each of those, we'll try to set aside about 10 minutes uh, to answer questions, uh, assuming that you have some questions in the chat. Uh, and then at the end, we have uh, a couple of questions actually that I have for you as well. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Uh, last month at Microsoft Inspire conference in July, uh, Microsoft's senior leadership team, including CEO Satya Nadella, announced some pretty significant changes for Azure Stack HCI. And my goal in the next hour is to unpack some of those announcements and help to give that next level of detail so that you understand what all of the news is for Azure Stack HCI. Before I jump into that, um, I'll just introduce myself and then give a couple of brief pieces of context first. So for those who may not know me, my name is Cosmos Darwin. I'm a senior program manager on the Azure Edge and Platform team, specifically the core operating systems team within Microsoft. Uh, the team that I work on is responsible for the strategy for Azure Stack HCI, as well as ensuring that we actually execute against that strategy. 
And we also make all of the operating systems that all of Microsoft product uses. So that includes Windows Server, of course, which is one of our personal favorites always, as well as uh, any other products at Microsoft that rely on an operating system. You can imagine that's quite a few different products. So that's me, that's my role. Uh, I'm coming to you live right now from the west coast of the US, so it's a little bit late for me, but we figured the morning time slot was the best time for you. So without further ado, let's dive in. Now, before we talk specifically about the news for Azure Stack HCI, uh, there's sort of two pieces of context that I think it makes sense to give. The first one is that Azure Stack HCI is just the latest member of the growing portfolio of Azure Stack products from Microsoft. You may already be familiar with some of the other products in this family. There's Azure Stack Hub, which is a cloud-native integrated system. It's a little bit like having your own Azure region. You can deploy four, eight, 12, or 16 nodes, and you get a full local instance of the Azure Resource Manager, the Azure Portal, as well as a set of Azure PaaS services in addition to IaaS. So it really is like having your own little Azure region in your data center. That's Azure Stack Hub. On the other end, there's also Azure Stack Edge, which is a cloud-managed appliance from Microsoft. It's a 1U compute server on Microsoft's own first-party hardware. You rent both the server and the software, uh, and there's no minimum commitment. You, you order one directly from the Azure portal. It arrives. You can use it for edge local computing and AI inferencing at the edge, things like processing video streams, things like that. And then when you're done, you just send it back to Microsoft. It even comes with a return address printed directly on the device. So that's the other members of the Azure Stack portfolio. And of course, today we're here to talk about Azure Stack HCI. If you want to learn about the others, you can go to azure.com slash Azure Stack to learn more. The second piece of context that I want to give is that Azure Stack HCI, the product that I'll be talking about today, takes its name from a program that Microsoft has run for several years now using recent versions of Windows Server. I say this because that program was really popular. And if you do like an internet search for Azure Stack HCI, you may find documentation and references that refer to that program that we called Azure Stack HCI. And that may cause some confusion, so sorry about that. The new product that I'll be talking about today is uh, a purpose-built product offering specifically intended to show Microsoft's commitment to the hyper-converged infrastructure market. It's something that we're launching this year but it does use the same name as the program from before. So sorry if that causes any confusion. Okay, with those two pieces of context set, let's unpack really what Azure Stack HCI is. And we can think about what is Azure Stack HCI in kind of three parts. The first part is, well, Azure Stack HCI is a hyper-converged infrastructure stack. What I mean by that is it's software that you run on your servers, on your premises, and it includes Azure's latest hypervisor with built-in software-defined storage and software-defined networking. So it's, it's HCI, of course. It's also delivered as an Azure hybrid service. Now we'll talk about what that means, but in short, it's you know something that you obtain from Microsoft Azure. You can manage it through Microsoft Azure and support and billing all flows through Microsoft Azure, even though it runs on your premises. And last but certainly not least, an extremely important priority for our team is that as we design the Azure Stack HCI product, we always put the needs of IT at the center so that it's familiar for IT to manage and operate using their existing skills, using the tools and processes that you already have. So you don't need to relearn everything just to modernize with hyper-converged infrastructure. So that's what Azure Stack HCI is. And for the next little while, I'd like to dive into each of these areas one at a time. So we can start by talking in more detail about hyper-converged infrastructure. Now in the last couple of years, hyper-converged infrastructure has absolutely become the normal way that organizations deploy new physical server infrastructure. Whether that's in a data center or at a branch office, this is becoming the normal way to deploy servers. With hyper-converged infrastructure, you consolidate and converge that traditional three-tier architecture where you had your hypervisors and your storage and your network appliances all separate. And you consolidate that down into just industry standard x86 servers, which bring their own additional high-speed storage and high-speed networking components included in the hypervisor hosts. 
Software defined storage turns those additional data disks into virtual data volumes, which you can pull together. Those include resiliency and other advanced storage features. And the included software defined networking creates virtual switches, networks, load balancers, and gateways using those high speed networking components. Some of the typical advantages of hyperconverged infrastructure include uh, increasing performance. Uh, I'm sorry, here. Increasing performance, so with Azure Stack HCI, we have demonstrated uh, over a million IOPS per server, uh, which Storage Review did not hesitate to call the fastest they have seen in the HCI market, as well as reducing costs because of that consolidation, because it's simpler to operate. Uh, it's often very, very affordable as compared to traditional storage. In fact, our customer, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, said that if they had chosen to go with a SAN, a storage array, instead of Azure Stack HCI, it would have cost them about four times more. So that's, you know, these are just a few of the reasons that customers are, are moving en masse toward hyper-converged infrastructure as the standard way for them to deploy servers. So that's what you might already have known about. Let's talk now about what's new. With Azure Stack HCI, Microsoft is now introducing a specialized host operating system that is designed specifically for hyper-converged infrastructure. This host operating system includes the latest hypervisor from Microsoft Azure. It's the same hypervisor we use to run our hyperscale cloud, and it has built-in software-defined storage and software-defined networking. The software-defined storage, of course, is what you may know as Storage Spaces Direct. This new operating system is optimized for virtualization. There's a reduced composition. We've removed many of the pieces that are not necessary for, for HCI. And it has a minimal local user interface that is designed specifically from the ground up for remote management. When you turn on this product, you'll see that it looks and feels distinctly Azure. But it's not just about streamlining the product and reducing things that are unnecessary we're also adding a number of exciting new features. One feature that is available in this new Azure Stack HCI operating system is one of the most requested features that customers have asked us about for many, many years now. And that is the ability to stretch a storage spaces direct cluster between two sites. This could be two rooms, two different fire zones within the same building, or even two different buildings or two different cities using the built-in synchronous or asynchronous replication that's included with Azure Stack HCI, you can replicate all of the storage from one site to the other site so that in the event you have some kind of a disaster, all of the virtual machines will automatically fail over to the other site where they will find a full copy of their storage and they'll be able to continue running. This gives you native business continuity and disaster recovery, BCDR, with Azure Stack HCI with no need for third-party software or anything complicated to set up. Everything is automatic and straightforward to use. And in fact, I can show you a demo of that to give you just an idea of how easy it works. So now let's do a very quick little demo of disaster recovery with Azure Stack HCI. I'm gonna start using Windows Admin Center, which is the default management tool for Azure Stack HCI. And you'll see that when I create a cluster, I can choose that I would like to deploy Azure Stack HCI as the OS for that cluster. And then I can choose whether all my servers are in one site or if they are distributed between two sites. If I choose two sites, then later on in the workflow, I'll be prompted to give those sites a name, for example, Paris and London, and then to indicate which of my servers are in which of those sites. Once I've done that, any time that I go to provision storage later on, I can choose whether I would like to create a new storage volume on one site or for disaster recovery to replicate it between two sites. I can choose the replication direction, for example, from Paris to London or from London to Paris. I can choose whether the replication should be synchronous or asynchronous. And there are a number of other advanced options as well. As you can see, it is built directly into the user interface for Azure Stack HCI and for managing storage so it's very easy to set up this kind of synchronous or asynchronous replication to stretch a cluster between two locations. But that's just one example of what's new and improved in this latest version of Azure Stack HCI. Let me tell you about something else. 
we have completely re-engineered the engine that is used to repair and resynchronize data in Storage Spaces Direct so that it's much, much faster. What you see on the slide here is a comparison of how long it takes for Storage Spaces to finish repairing after a server has been restarted, comparing the latest version of Azure Stack HCI version 20H2 against the most recent version of Windows, Windows Server 2019. As you can see in the average case, Azure Stack HCI is almost four times faster than Windows Server at resynchronizing Storage Spaces Direct data. And in the worst case, in the 99th percentile case, the extreme case, it's almost five times faster. This is based on testing in Microsoft's lab using a variety of hardware and a variety of different workload patterns with a moderate intensity where we applied a typical monthly patch for the host operating system and then measured how long it took to restart. So this is really a game-changing improvement that makes applying updates and restarting servers much, much faster. And on that topic of applying updates, there's something else that we're working on which will be available very soon with this new version of Azure Stack HCI. And that's integrated full stack updates with just one click. Now, what do I mean by that? As you can see in the screenshot here, we're working very closely with our OEM partners like Dell EMC and others to build an integrated experience for rolling out a cluster aware update across all the nodes in the cluster that includes not just the operating system updates, not just the software from Microsoft, but also the firmware and drivers that you need and that are recommended by the solution vendor. You can see on the screen here a prototype, a working prototype of this snap-in extension from Dell EMC. This is our friends at Dell using the absolute latest in extensibility technology that we have been putting into Windows Admin Center specifically for this scenario. Now we're still working with them very closely on this. It's not quite ready yet, but we can't wait to get this into your hands. This is so important for enterprises who need to stay compliant from the top of the stack all the way down, and this is gonna make it much, much easier. So that's just a couple of examples of the things that are new for hyper-converged infrastructure, for the core stack, for the storage, the disaster recovery, the updating experience of Azure Stack HCI, things that are new for that in this new version, version 20H2. Now we have a lot more to talk about, but I wanna pause here because we've covered a lot of ground already and see if there are any questions, Karsten, related to those first couple of features that I just described. Yes, indeed, they are. Uh, thanks, Cosmo, so far. Um, first question I, I have seen, I will read it to you. Hi, Cosmos, do you have plans the old Azure Stack HCI based on data center to rename? In my options, the new HCI version 20H2 is a different product from for different customer needs. And you addressed that a bit, that's a bit confusing, but are there maybe plans to rename uh, something there? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good question. So uh, in the long run, we anticipate that almost all customers who want to have hyper-converged infrastructure from Microsoft are going to choose this new, and um, as you'll see in a moment, always up-to-date subscription service for HCI from Microsoft. So we do think that in the next couple of years, almost all customers are going to choose this product line and the program based on Windows Server um, is probably not going to cause the confusion that it does today. Uh, how exactly we refer to those Windows Server based solutions is a good question. Uh, I have started personally calling them Windows Server based HCI to make the distinction between Windows Server HCI and Azure Stack HCI. Uh, but whether we come up with a new name for the Windows Server program is, is we don't have a plan right now. Um, We'll, we, we'll come up with something if we need to, but I plan to just start in, indicating the operating system when I talk about it. So saying Windows Server or saying Azure Stack HCI. Yeah. Um, Thorsten, the other question I will address later uh, when we are through the second part. So uh, next question was, will stretching be available to data center VNX? So uh, Windows Server HCI, I think is the question. Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. Our focus from Microsoft is definitely on this new Azure Stack HCI product. We think customers are really going to enjoy a lot of the things that we're doing here, from the more frequent feature updates to the more flexible pricing 
to the operating system that's really purpose built with the experience from the get-go designed for HCI. So we anticipate focusing our energy almost exclusively on this product. There will, of course, be a next version of Windows Server, and that next version will, of course, include all the roles and features that customers have come to love over the years, like Hyper-V and like Storage Spaces Direct. But I would not count on new features for those specific roles going into that Windows Server product. Our focus on with Windows Server is going to be the traditional server scenarios, all the other things that Windows Server does so well, like DNS, DHCP, Active Directory, File Services, IIS, all of those scenarios. And with HCI, we're really going to be focusing on this new Azure Stack HCI product. OK, the next question is, how many nodes do I need uh, to, uh, to stretch a cluster? And yeah, what that's is a the great... minimum network speed uh, between the sites? That's a great question. So the minimum nodes for an Azure Stack HCI normally would be two. So that would be just a two node cluster. If you're going to do a stretched cluster, you do need two, ne two nodes on each site. So a total of four nodes. The reason for that is that each site behaves just like a cluster of size one half. So just like a cluster of two nodes, meaning you can do two-way mirroring that's local to that site. You can do nested resiliency that's local to that site. Each side behaves like a two node cluster. And so you do need at least four to do a stretch cluster. There was also a question in there about network speed. Yeah. Uh, there's a two part answer. So if you want to do asynchronous replication, meaning uh, there's some sort of recovery point objective or RPO, but it's not zero. So we actually are able to complete a, a read or a write on, or I guess it's really just a write, complete a write on one side and then send back an acknowledgement and be done and then replicate it as soon as we can, but we don't have to wait. So if you're doing async like that, then there is no minimum uh, bandwidth requirement and there is no maximum latency requirement uh, between the two sites. If you want to do synchronous replication, meaning we actually cannot finish a write on one side until we have succeeded the, the replication, so we're much more sensitive in that case to the performance of that site-to-site -site link, in that case, we do require at least a one gigabit connection between the sites, and the round trip latency should be less than five milliseconds. And faster is always better. Faster is always better, but that's the, the minimum that we think makes sense for synchronous, because again, in a synchronous replication mode, uh, that latency between the sites is going to be part of every single write that you do, right? So it, you're very, very sensitive to that, and it's important to keep it low. If you want to do asynchronous, which is actually a little bit more similar to what other competitors call near synchronous, right? Where the recovery point objective is 30 seconds or one minute or five minutes, things like that. Um, so maybe near synchronous is the better word. If you want to do that, then there's no minimum. It's it's up to you and what recovery point objective you're willing to tolerate. My And I allowed to say that my gut would say increase that at least to 10, uh, 10 uh, gigabit between the sides for synchronous because I see customers doing doing it then with one gigabit and they are very disappointed how fast HCI is because uh, essentially the block you write has to go on the other side over a one gigabit link and has to wait until the act is coming back, right? Okay, we have more yeah, questions it, here. I agree with that, by the way. It, it certainly depends on how active the workloads are, but if you're going to try to do more than a few hundred megabytes per second of reads and writes, then yeah, you definitely are going to want more than one gigabit of networking. Okay. Uh, there was a question: uh, if uh, the traditional Azure Stack HCI, so, so as you as you named it, Windows uh, Windows based HCI will be continued. You answered that already. You said in vNext there will be storage spaces direct, but you don't think there will be much. There will be new features, uh, maybe not. Um, you answered that. Um, then, will there be a SPLA license for the new Azure Stack HCI iOS? I think uh, you will ask that, or you will uh, go into that in the next part of the presentation, right? When you talk about yeah, it, it, it. Let's save that question though, because I'm happy to talk about that specifically, and we should just talk about it after the next section. I okay. agree. I will mark it for if we don't. Uh, if we don't come to that. So can you upgrade? Oh, this is a question I got already from another customer. Can you upgrade from older S2D installation? So Windows-based HCI to Azure Stack, Azure Stack HCI. Yeah, it's a very good question. 
uh, so the short answer is there is a there is a path to get from one to the other, but it is not a rolling cluster upgrade. We really, really wanted to do a rolling cluster upgrade. It turns out there are actually legal reasons that we can't. Windows is so big and so important that we aren't allowed to have Windows and Azure in the same cluster <laughs> um, because they, there's uh, APIs and protocols that uh, Windows uses that we can't give Azure the ability to interact with those. Um, and so what you do have to do, unfortunately, is schedule a window of time where you will take the cluster down and then stop all the VMs, stop the, stop the storage, stop the cluster, upgrade all the nodes to HCI at the same time, and then start the cluster again and bring the, the storage and the VMs back online. You, so it will be possible to do that. It will provide documentation for how to do it, uh, but it's not going to be a seamless zero downtime rolling upgrade. And with to clarify, with update, you mean you install Azure Stack HCI on the on the nodes over the Windows uh, data center edition? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, I have I have a question myself. Uh, so you said for a stretch cluster, you need at least uh, four nodes, uh, two on each side, and you can do nested uh, resiliency. And I love nested resiliency. Uh, one problem is um, if we want to extend this stretch cluster to say three nodes on each side, because we have more workload. Yeah. Uh, in the moment, it's not possible from f to to do uh, an upgrade from two nodes with nested resiliency to three nodes because nested resiliency is not there. You have only three-way mirror or two-way mirror. Are you thinking about that? Will that be maybe in, in a future release that you can go for nested resiliency to something else because you need more nodes? It's feedback that we're we're very open to. We've yeah. I've heard this a couple of times, but I'll be honest, it's not something I hear very often. Um, we customers who add nodes, it certainly happens, and it's something that we make a very good point of supporting. Uh, but it tends to be customers whose deployments sort of started larger to begin with. So they started with six, and now they're adding seven and eight. Uh, customers who start with two nodes tend to stay with two nodes. And so this is not something we've been prioritizing very highly, but if there is a demand for it, if customers need it, that's certainly something that we're happy to, to do. I agree with you uh, for for the stand, for the two node installation. I, I hear sometimes they want to increase it, yes, but in a stretch cluster, you maybe start with four nodes and the next step would be to go to six nodes. To, so I think there a lot of more people uh, want to upgrade it, but I think that is something for a later release to, le to at least think about. So um, then we have a license question. We will postpone that, Jan. Um, then another question uh, regarding resync duration. Uh, running a four node 2019 cluster with hybrid disks, so SSDs and uh, HDDs in the three-way mirror, it takes sometimes four hours to resync repair one node, I think, Marcos. When now the Azure Stack version gets an improvement, the on-premise version needs that too. That's a statement. That's not a question, Marcos. So we, uh, Marcos wants to have the fast <laughs> repair also on the on the Windows HCI. But Cosmos already said he he doesn't think the the features will be ported to uh, Windows HCI. Correct, Cosmos? Well, I think that's yeah. Y y you got that right. I do. I do want to emphasize though. Um, both the Windows Server-based Azure Stack HCI, you know, and this new Azure Stack HCI OS that's specifically designed for these scenarios, uh, they both want, they both run on-premises, right? They are both, at the end of the day, a way for customers to keep their data in its entirety within their data centers, within their control, close to users, close to apps, close to, close to databases, whatever the requirement is. Both of these are fundamentally on-premises products. So if you want the faster repair on-prem, that's awesome. Use the new Azure Stack HCI. <laughs> You open the can of worms here. <laughs> so uh, I have another question from Torsten that's important. Uh, can I use mm -hmm. the storage active, active in stretch cluster? And I think, Torsten, you mean uh, you write in both sides of the volume. Right, Torsten? Yeah, so I, so I, can, I can clarify how this works. So each volume is only mounted on one side at a time. And so... Uh, in that sense, on a per volume basis, the volumes are active passive. However, the overall cluster is active active. And so you can have many, many volumes, right? You've met, it's very common for people to create 10 or 20 or more volumes with, uh, with an HCI cluster like this. And some of the volumes can be mounted on Paris, 
and then replicating to London. And some of the volumes can be mounted on London and replicating to Paris. Now within each volume, they have to go in one direction at a time, but this means you can have virtual machines running on both sites. So you don't have any nodes that are idling or, or empty. You can have both sites be active. Um, you just have to choose sort of which volumes are on which side. Okay, I, we have still questions here, so I, I ask for questions. You did also, so we get questions. That's great. Uh, does Azure Stack HCI support HGS to build a guarded fabric? So uh, the, ha the host guardian service, uh, it doesn't have to run on the Azure Stack HCI, but the question is, will you support uh, shielded VMs, so a guarded fabric? The good news is the answer to that is easy, yes. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, can we expect any official tool from Microsoft for VMware to Hyper-V conversions? Gerald, I don't think that's something Microsoft has time to build. They tried it multiple times, but Cosmos, if you have to say something to that. So uh, uh, we, uh, we have created a team that is dedicated to making it easier for customers to migrate to Azure Stack HCI. Okay. I do not know which platforms they are going to target first. Uh, but there didn't used to be a team, and now there is a team. Oh, that's good news. So this. So stay tuned, Gerald. There is something. Uh, there is something in the works. Uh, I have to. I have to. Uh, are you translating these? I'm impressed. Uh, no, some of them I'm not. Uh, most of them are in English. Uh, now I have a hard to translate. <laughs> A hard one to translate. Um, so, if there is a, a stretched, uh, stretched uh, HCI cluster, uh, mm -hmm. the, the question is about the SDN tile. So, uh, so the SDN part, the software-defined networking part. Uh, what about the network controller role? Uh, is it is it required, and how is the routing done? So, I think Cosmos is not the right the right. Uh, people to ask about that. For that, we need maybe a network guy. Or, or do you feel comfortable uh, talking about that? So in a stretch cluster, if you have SDN over both sides, you have the network controller role. And uh, how does it work? Do you know something about that? It's a good question. I don't know the full answer. What I will say is the SDN team is working hard on multi-site. Yeah. And that includes not just two sides of a stretch cluster, but actually other scenarios as well. So I'll let them describe that functionality. I apologize. I'm not going to be able to do a good enough job explaining it. Uh, but the team is is working on supporting stretch clustering with SDN. Mm -hmm. Then there is a question from Jürgen. And uh, I, I will... I will um, only ask for another five minutes because we want to see the rest of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so driver and firmware updates. Is it possible to buy servers from local manufacturers like Thomas Krenn? And Thomas Krenn is an example. It's, uh... Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. So, and I'll talk about that a little bit when I get to the, um, the last part of this presentation. So we will but the short answer, the short answer is yes, uh, all of the partners who have been part of the Windows Server-based HCI, we are encouraging to participate in Azure Stack HCI. We anticipate that all of them will do that. Um, and they will not be required to build these more advanced integrations like full stack updates. Um, so for some partners, it makes sense. For other partners, maybe it does not make sense for them to do that. And we are going to be uh, evolving our hardware program, our hardware validation program, and adding multiple um, levels of solutions. We'll have more to share about that later this year, though. We're not getting into the details of that right now. OK. So, um, but I have a question to add here. So, but it's still OK to, to put Azure Stack HCI on hardware that is not certified. For example, if you have older hardware, uh, I have, for example, a Dell uh, R73 uh, cluster and Azure Stack HCI, when I put it on there, it's still okay if it's uh, that I run it on my own or build my um, build, uh, um, a solution with my own hardware. Or are you strictly saying only on uh, certified hardware that is in the Azure Stack HCI program? Uh, so good question. There's some nuance there. You are not required to buy new hardware to run Azure Stack HCI. So if you have existing suitable hardware, you can absolutely install the new software on that hardware. With that said, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but we are uh, only going to be able to offer official support on platforms that 
match something that's in the catalog. So you don't have to go buy it new. Uh, but for example, if you have a Dell R740 or you have a DL380 Gen 10 or something, and you have it from last year, but it's in the catalog, then you can use that hardware. Okay. Um, so it does have to be something that has been validated by an OEM. But as you'll see a little later, that's an immense amount of choice. I mean, there's more than 200 solutions now. Okay. So um, another question is, can I later add a site to a new HCI cluster to stretch a cluster? So yes, you can. Okay, that's cool. I didn't know that. So uh, when you create an Azure Stack HCI cluster now, you'll see instead of there simply being no sites, uh, the behavior now is that there is one site and all of your nodes are in that site. And that makes it very easy to add a second site later. And then when you bring in the nodes, you just put them in the second site. We'll automatically provision the storage uh, and you can start doing the replication. It's, it's, it's really quite easy. Yeah. We're designing for that scenario as a first class scenario, just like the one where you deploy the whole cluster stretched at the beginning. Okay, so um, another question is about the sites. Will there be more than two sites? I would love to hear feedback about uh, scenarios where customers need more than two sites. In the first version of Azure Stack HCI, the one that we announced uh, last month, uh, the requirements are exactly two, well, one or two sites. And if you do have two sites, you need to have the same number of nodes on both sites. So two and two or three and three or four and four, things like that. But if there is a need for another site, like for uh, A to B and then B to C, and maybe the first one is synchronous and the second one is asynchronous or something like that. Uh, and if there's a need for the sites to have different numbers of nodes, we would love to hear that feedback. We're starting with the simplest case, uh, but we're very interested in adding the more advanced cases if there's a genuine need from customers. Okay, cool. So all the licensing question, I postpone and please ask them again after uh, the part where uh, Cosmos talks about the licensing, I will not. I will only address now the technical questions. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, there's another question about uh, Azure services on HCI. I will also postpone that. Um, yeah, and we'll have. I'll say a few things in the next couple of minutes, but also we have. Uh, a pretty exciting announcement about that coming at Microsoft Ignite next month. So definitely stay tuned. For oh, that. that's very cool. So don't miss the Ignite presentation. It's Ignite is free now and it's online. And I will talk after Ignite. Of course, I will do a webinar with all the cool stuff from Ignite. Um, and and I hope and I hope you'll have me back too. Ah, if you want to, I, I'm very pleased to do that. Will the <laughs> Oh, there, will there be a converged version of Azure Stack HCI set up to so scale out file server? I know the answer already, but Cosmos, please. It's a it's a really, really good question. So we're starting with a little bit like with the stretch cluster question. We're starting with the simple case that we think is most common. Uh, we know the data today for how many people use uh, storage spaces direct in HCI versus in disaggregated. Uh, it's overwhelmingly HCI. Um, like it's it's not even close. Uh, it's it's like approximately 90 to 10. <laughs> so we're focusing first and foremost on HCI. But again, if there is a, a strong signal from customers, if the demand is there, we'll absolutely uh, you know, expand to more scenarios if it makes sense. So um, I think we roughly got through it. Let me just check. Uh, is there a migration path in place update to convert? Uh, Dino, we already addressed that. Uh, is uh, there is a question about an air gap to disconnected version from one of my friends Johannes um, uh, Cosmos will address that later uh, so I will go through okay uh, what is the date is ignite ignite is in September I think it's the 22nd to 24th of September but you I will that, that's correct so that's correct it's in almost exactly one month. And uh, with witness, uh, Heiko, it's the same. We need a witness in the cluster. And uh, if it's a stretch scenario, of course, we need a third site or Azure. I, I just asked it. I, I think that's correct, Cosmos, right? With a stretch cluster, you need a witness. And it has yep, to be on the third correct. site. With, yeah, you need, a, you need a witness. And we think, uh, given the nature of this Azure Stack HCI product, by far the easiest thing for almost every customer is going to be a cloud-based witness. Just create a blob. Um, it doesn't cost hardly anything. I think it costs like one penny per year. Um, 
And then you don't even need to worry about setting up a third site yourself. Okay, and with that, we are through the technical questions. Here are lots of licensing questions, uh, um, disconnected questions, and so on. But I know you will address that uh, a bit later. And guys, if it's not addressed, please ask your question again. We, again, because I have so much, I I, I lose track uh, what what we answered and what not. So please. <laughs> The, the licensing question, ask them again after uh, Cosmos did the second part or the third part of the presentation. So Cosmos, please go on. We have already 40 minutes. We are 40 minutes in. <laughs> yeah, no, this is great. I love the enthusiasm. I love the engagements. These are all really, really wonderful. Yeah, me questions. too, but Thank you have you to go to sleep uh, after this. <laughs> at some point, at some point. And everybody else has to go to work, right? Um, so yeah, let's, let's switch gears now. And we talked a little bit about the core HCI stack, right? So innovations that are part of clustering or part of storage or part of uh, the upgrade experience, things like that. Those are core HCI technology stack innovations. That's just some of the things that are that are in the new version of HCI. We're of course working on many, many more things in that area. But let's switch gears now and talk about what it means to deliver Azure Stack HCI as an Azure hybrid service. Like what do we mean by that? Because it's a very, I think, confusing phrase for a lot of people. To, to set the context for why this is um, the way that Azure Stack HCI is going to be delivered going forward, it's important to take a step back and think about what are the big challenges confronting IT organizations today. Uh, when we talk with customers, one of the top uh, concerns that comes up over and over is that most organizations are moving some of their workloads to the cloud, they also anticipate that some of their workloads are going to stay on premises because there's good reasons for that, whether it's data residency, uh, data sovereignty, whether it's latency, it could be latency between an application and database, it could be latency between an application and an end user, it could be latency between an application and the source of the data, like a sensor or a camera. Whatever the reason is, there's lots of good reasons that some part of an, of an IT estate is going to stay on premises when other parts are going to move to the cloud. And so organizations, if you do surveys, everybody anticipates that a couple of years from now, they're going to have some things on prem and some things in the cloud. And how they make that work is a big challenge. Hybrid is hard. Whether it's networking or identity uh, or something else, it's just difficult to set up and manage a hybrid infrastructure. Now, for customers who have chosen Microsoft Azure as their cloud of choice for that hybrid journey, we wanted to make Azure Stack HCI as frictionless and as, as natural as possible for them to use. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing there. The first thing is that this new Azure Stack HCI OS, when you finish setting it up, it natively integrates with Microsoft Azure, meaning it shows up as a first class resource in a resource group, in your subscription, in the Azure portal. There is no agent that you need for this. There's no fancy or complicated script. It's a native capability of the Azure Stack HCI OS. And in fact, I can make this simple by just showing you a demo. So let's take a look now at Azure Stack HCI in the Azure portal. I'm going to go to portal.azure.com in my browser. And if you're a customer who has used Azure before, then you have certainly seen this, right? This is just the, the same home page as you always use for the Azure portal. What you have not seen before is this new Azure Stack HCI resource type. This is actually a cloud service that shows me all of my on-premises HCI clusters running the HCI operating system straight here in Azure. As you can see, I have two of them and I can select one of my clusters and actually see information about it directly here in the Azure portal. So in this case, I can see that it's a two server cluster. There's node one and node two. The hardware is Lenovo, it's SE350 Edge servers. I can see some additional details like how many cores, how much memory, what the operating system version is that's installed. I can see that it's connected to Azure. And as you can tell, there's more functionality that our team is building out here on this page. So this is just the beginning. Over the coming months and years, the number of management options and the things that you can see on this page will become more and more. Now, just because we have a first class Azure Resource Manager resource representing this on-premises cluster, that actually gives us quite a few different things that we can do. For one thing, 
uh, we benefit from all of the standard constructs of the Azure Resource Manager. So this means we can categorize our clusters with tags, we can organize them into resource groups. If we have tens or hundreds or thousands of clusters, we can see them all in one single pane of glass here in the Azure portal. And this is a completely managed infrastructure, so I don't need to worry about the scale of a hundred or a thousand clusters reporting performance metrics or reporting their status into Azure. I, I assure you, the Azure front door CDN can handle that just fine, right? So you don't have to worry about setting up the infrastructure just to monitor all of these clusters if you have a lot of them. It all just reports to Azure. So these are some of the advantages, but there's actually a lot more here as well. One thing that we've heard a lot of feedback about is that Azure customers, customers who have chosen Azure for, their, for the part of their estate that is going to move to the cloud, they love Azure support. And so the new Azure Stack HCI is covered by Azure support. We've been working for uh, almost a year now to build a dedicated team of experts, uh, people who are senior escalation engineers from across Microsoft with the expertise that they need for things like Hyper-V and Storage Spaces Direct and clustering. And that dedicated team, which is a new team within Azure support, is going to handle any support case related to this new Azure Stack HCI. Just like with any other Azure service, you can access self-help resources or request technical support directly from the Azure portal. There's just a little button on any resource where you say new support case, and that works for Azure Stack HCI just like it works for any other service that you use. And what's really great, especially for small customers, is that this means you no longer need a premier agreement just to get support for Storage Spaces Direct. So you can choose a plan from Azure support that suits your needs starting at just $29 a month for developers and $100 a month for standard support. So you can see all the plans that are available at azure.com slash support um, to learn more, but this covers any number of clusters that you have in your account. These prices are per account. So it's a very affordable way of getting a high quality support experience with Azure Stack HCI. And in addition to managing Azure Stack HCI from Azure, getting support for Azure Stack HCI through Azure, Azure Stack HCI is also delivered as a modern subscription through Microsoft Azure. So if you're a customer who already has a Microsoft Azure account, then you already have a subscription, and you probably know that any cloud service you choose to consume, whether it's a virtual machine or storage or Azure monitoring or something else, all of those are just charged centrally to your Azure subscription. Each service becomes a line item on your bill. And Azure Stack HCI works exactly the same way. So there is a predictable monthly fee that covers both the cloud functionality I've described here as well as the on-premises uh, HCI infrastructure. And that predictable fee, which has a very simple cost structure, it's just based on how many processor cores there are in the hardware. So it does not vary with how many VMs there are. It does not vary with how much memory you have. It does not vary based on network ingress or network egress or the amount of storage. It doesn't vary based on really anything other than the number of physical processor cores. So it's very simple and very predictable. And what's, what's super cool is this subscription approach to HCI does not have a big upfront license cost, and it doesn't really have versions in the way that you might have expected from traditional versions of Windows Server. And so if you think about you know, buying 2019 and then, oh, if you want the features in Windows Server vNext, then you have to buy Windows Server vNext all over again, you don't have to do that with Azure Stack HCI because it's an always up-to-date subscription product. So as long as you are subscribing, you receive all of the latest features for HCI as over-the-air feature updates. Now this Azure Stack HCI subscription does not include guest operating systems or guest applications. So it's just the HCI infrastructure and we'll be publishing more details, including a thorough uh, white paper that describes all of the details here at azure.com slash pricing as we get closer to GA for this new product. During the, during the preview period, Azure Stack HCI is not built, so it's, it's no charge. So that's the case right now. So if you were to go try this right now, it, you wouldn't be paying anything. Now, one of the things that we really wanted to accomplish with this new subscription pricing for Azure Stack HCI was to design especially around these smaller scale deployments at the edge and in branch offices and retail stores where it doesn't make sense necessarily to deploy a large cluster with tons and tons of cores. 
If you have a small set of needs for a branch office, you may only need small hardware and you may only have a small number of virtual machines. And the new Azure Stack HCI is really great for that. So it's not just about the support pricing. Um, the HCI infrastructure itself has no minimum cores that are required. So uh, if you have four cores, uh, it's 40 US dollars per month. If you have eight cores, it's 80 US dollars per month. It's a simple predictable cost structure of 10 US dollars per core per month. That's it. So very straightforward pricing uh, with no minimums and no maximums. Now these capabilities that I've just described uh, augment and build on the existing hybrid functionality that was already available with Windows Server. So we've talked before about using Azure Policy through Azure Arc, about using Azure Backup and Azure Site Recovery to protect VMs or uh, you know, securely networking between an on-premises virtual network and an Azure virtual network. Those are all hybrid capabilities we've talked about before. And what I've just described that's new here for Azure Stack HCI is really our first big step toward transforming HCI itself into being something that is hybrid by nature, that is hybrid first. So this visibility in the portal, billing through Azure, support through Azure, these are the things that are available in preview now as of July. And they're also just the beginning. There's a ton of additional functionality that our teams at Microsoft are working to bring over the coming months and years. And there's one that I would like to show you, if I may, just to give you a little sneak peek. And that is self-service virtual machines on top of Azure Stack HCI. This isn't something that's available just yet, but it will be available soon. And it's one of the top requested features for Azure Stack HCI in the last couple of years. Soon, you'll be able to delegate access to your Azure Stack HCI cluster to other users within your Azure Active Directory so that they can create virtual machines on top of your HCI cluster. This gives them a consistent set of tools. They'll be able to use the Azure portal and the Azure CLI to provision VMs, including templating. And then those VMs will get deployed against your on-premises HCI cluster. This not only gives you self-service, it also gives you a kind of concept of tenancy because these users, these AAD users to whom you delegate permission will not have access to the underlying infrastructure. So they'll be able to create VMs, but they won't be able to go in and make a mistake like accidentally restart a host or something like that. So this is one of the most requested features. Um, I'm super excited to get this into people's hands and to hear what you guys think. Uh, this is a really great example of the things that are possible because we're leveraging the power of Azure and the power of Azure Arc to make on-premises technologies like HCI even better. So that's just a couple of examples of what we mean when we say that Azure Stack HCI is delivered as an Azure hybrid service, even though the infrastructure and the data is completely running and residing on your premises. So Karsten, that's the end of part two. <laughs> yes. uh, shall we pause and take questions then about, uh, about that hybrid capabilities? Yes, uh, I think you have to go to bed a little bit later. <laughs> I have lots of questions, but of course, uh, if you are talking about delivered as an Azure hybrid service, you know there will be questions, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. This is one of the biggest and most exciting changes we've made in a long time. So yeah. I, I imagine there's a lot of questions. Yeah. I'm happy to take them. So the uh, the the most um, the most asked question is about the disconnected. So uh, people don't want that. They ask if there is a way to not uh, connect uh, Azure Stack HCI to the cloud. So like an offline uh, mode or like the the ship mode or the um, the the drill rig mode where you don't have a connection to Azure uh, to Azure. Yeah, it's a great question. So I should clarify a little bit what uh, the connectivity requirements are for this Azure Stack HCI service. So uh, it does not need to be connected all the time. It does not need a high bandwidth connection or a continuous connection. And you are not required to manage it only from the Azure portal. So all of the local tools that you're familiar with, whether that's Windows Admin Center or PowerShell or System Center, you can continue to use those local tools to manage Azure Stack HCI within your premises. And so if you want to uh, you know, run this in a place where you have a very bad connection or run it uh, on a boat and sometimes you're at sea for days at a time and you don't have internet, those are all scenarios that Azure Stack HCI addresses really, really well. Um, in this initial version of Azure Stack HCI, we do need to periodically connect outbound 
to Azure in order to sync some basic information, such as the billing information, but also some of the metadata that we display in the Azure portal. Um, the requirement is that at least one time every 30 days, we need to successfully sync that data. Now, this is actually a very constrained set of data. It's a couple of kilobytes. It's outbound only on HTTPS. Um, so from a firewalling perspective, it's pretty easy to work around. Um, but that is required. So if you wanted to like deploy this somewhere where there was never internet and there will never be internet, um, then no, you, the Azure Stack HCI, at least in its first version, can't do that. Yeah. So um, addition from my side, you can also manage it with Hyper-V and failover, Hyper-V manager and failover cluster manager and third party tools that use that interfaces, right? Uh, that's correct. Tools that work, you're free to use. Yeah. Um, and then, um, there are some concerns about the data that is sent to the cloud. So uh, in Germany, uh, you know, the Germans are very data sen sensitive and we have uh, also this GDPR. Uh, uh, so um, you have, it would be nice if you clarify on, on a site exactly what data is transferred to the cloud, then a lot of companies are not to al allowed to share uh, data uh, with the cloud. So uh, there are some questions about that. For example, this one, I see good reasons to use the old and the new Azure Stack HCI side by side, especially when new features like Windows Virtual Desktop and Microsoft 365 are available on Azure Stack HCI 20H2. So we have to re we have to talk about that, Torsten, because I don't think Microsoft announced anything that uh, uh, Windows Virtual Desktop or Mi uh, Microsoft 365 will be available on Azure Stack HCI 20H2. And so I continue with his uh, statement or question. At this point, all GDPR uh, issues will be solved as all company data will be local again, are there plans for it? Okay, this is a question if there will be something like virtual desktop, Windows virtual desktop and Microsoft 365 be on Azure Stack HCI. Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, let me, there's a few different questions there. So yeah, let me try are. to address each one, each part. So uh, the data that Azure Stack HCI synchronizes with Azure is absolutely something that we will document thoroughly so that you can see absolutely every property that we are transmitting. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised to see it as a very, very small payload. It's basically so that we can draw uh, the pixels in the Azure portal so that you can see your cluster and so that we can uh, handle things like if you file a support request or so that you can pay your bill through Azure. All right, so it's really pretty basic and we'll definitely document every single property so that customers can see full transparency what it is that we're sending. Mm -hmm. Now that data is transmitted to a Microsoft Azure region of your choice. So today the preview for Azure Stack HCI is available in two regions. Uh, it's available in East US and it's also available in West Europe. That West Europe data center is uh, just outside of Amsterdam. Uh, over the coming months and years, we will be bringing the Azure Stack HCI service, the endpoint to more regions, including regions within Germany. And what's really nice is when you sync with your cluster, your on-prem cluster, and it connects to a data center within Germany, you have a guarantee that that data, from a data residency perspective, stays completely within Germany. And so we absolutely plan to deliver on uh, the promises that customers need for us to satisfy local requirements and things like GDPR. So in the preview right now, you can already connect to West Europe, and we'll be adding more regions, including German regions, over time. So we are now, now the, at the... the second. Okay, sorry, Cosmos, go on. Uh, well, the second part of the question was about bringing specific cloud services onto Azure Stack HCI. And uh, to Carson, uh, Carson, you said it correctly. So we, we are going to be announcing more services over time. Right now, we haven't made any announcements related to the two that the person asked. So Windows Virtual Desktop and Office 365. Um, but based on customer feedback and based on customer demand, um, we agree that those would be some pretty exciting scenarios and we're very open to the idea of helping customers to run the parts of Azure that they would like to run uh, in a way that helps them to achieve their goals, including their data residency goals. Okay, so we now at an hour and uh, I know uh, we will continue with the webinar, but I know you have a, a poll you would like to uh, to have the people ask. So maybe you can, uh, you can um, um, send me the yeah, URL I, I, and I will post this in the chat and uh, we go on with the question. So the people at least can uh, can uh, participate in the poll. 
Well, yeah, we can also disseminate that afterward, I think. It's probably more important to do part three here, just to make sure we give the full picture. Yeah, I've, I've still then, questions uh, if, here, if we run out of time, I'm happy to do okay. the questions after part three. So if the people then want to drop yeah. out. So let, let's jump on and do part yeah. three so that we at least uh, you know wrap up the story while most people are still here. Yeah. Um, so we've talked so far about two things. We've talked about the core innovations in the core hyperconverged infrastructure stack from Microsoft. Uh, we've talked about how that is being productized and delivered as an Azure service. This is specifically because we know that as customers uh, move more and more into this hybrid mode of operating where they have some things in the cloud, other things on-prem, having a single billing relationship with Microsoft, having a single support relationship with Microsoft, and having a single control plane in the Azure portal is very, very convenient for customers. And that's going to become more and more true as time goes on and if customers have some things in the cloud, some things on-prem. So we've talked about that. Let's talk about the, the steps that we're taking to ensure that we always put the needs of IT at the center of this product. Right? At the end of the day, Azure Stack HCI is something that you deploy on your servers, on your premises. You're the administrator for it. You choose the tools that you use for it. And that's super, super important. So what are the, some of the things that we're doing to make sure that that stays true? The first thing is making sure that Azure Stack HCI is able to run on hardware that you get to choose from your preferred vendor. So we're continuing to work with over 20 partners, everyone who has been part of our hyperconverged program for the last few years. And together with them, we've created over 200 different validated solutions that you as a customer can choose from to run Azure Stack HCI. You can find all of them at azure.com slash HCI. Just to give you an idea, this catalog of validated solutions contains an incredible amount of diversity. Servers from 1U to 2U to 4U, some servers have an external JBOD, other servers are ruggedized or are tower form factor or a very small compact form factor. It's an immense amount of choice so that you, the customer, can choose the form factor for Azure Stack HCI that makes the most sense for your specific requirements. But even more than that, and Karsten, this gets to a question you asked a little bit earlier, each of these solutions is really, when you boil it down, it is a system with a host bus adapter and a network adapter family of, of adapters that use the same driver. That's fundamentally what a listing is in the Azure Stack HCI catalog. Almost all of these can be customized significantly. So you can choose the processor, choose the memory, choose the storage, choose the specific network networking speed that you need. So there's actually a lot more than 200 solutions. There's more like thousands of solutions because you can take those 200 and then customize them quite significantly. And all of that counts as what we would call a validated server for running Azure Stack HCI. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about using the Azure portal to see your Azure Stack HCI. And what I showed is functionality that's included, right? That's not something that's sold separately. But it's also not the only available management options. It's really important, we know, for folks to have access to local management tools that are at the edge so that if they have an internet access issue or if they have a limited connection, it's fine. They can continue to manage their hyper-converged infrastructure. And so for that, our real focus as Microsoft is on Admin Center, which is also included with Azure Stack HCI. And specifically, we're taking steps to converge the appearance of these two tools. Um, we're making a lot of changes actually to the Azure portal so that it looks more and more like Windows Admin Center. And on the other side, we're making Windows Admin Center look more and more like the Azure portal. And our goal is that customers should be able to use these two tools um, and even in the course of a single scenario, switch between them and it have it be very, very seamless. And I can show you a quick demo of the kinds of things that I mean when I say that. So I'm going to start here in Admin Center, and I'm looking at a list of all of my virtual machines. And you'll see I can select one of these virtual machines, and I have all the actions at the top that you think, like start and stop and pause my VM. And some of those actions, like protect VM, actually take advantage of Azure Cloud Services behind the scenes. So when I choose protect, what it's actually doing is backing up and replicating that VHD into Azure using Azure Site Recovery. Now, if I want to see the status of that replication, I can just click in Admin Center, and you'll see it takes me straight over now into the Azure portal where I can see that that replication is healthy and is progressing. And the tooling looks just like it did a moment ago. Of course, I'm still logged in. And so this is very seamless, but actually what happened there, it was kind of quick. But if you missed it, I switched from Admin Center to the Azure portal, and I can just as easily switch back in the other direction. 
And these are the kinds of scenarios that are truly hybrid. This is how we envision customers using and managing Azure Stack HCI for the coming couple of years. But it's not just about these modern tools, right? The Azure portal is great, Windows Admin Center is great, but we know that IT organizations have a set of tools and skills that they have invested in already to manage HCI, and that's super important. So Azure Stack HCI, the new one, version 20H2, has full compatible support with Windows PowerShell, the full .NET Windows PowerShell, meaning if you have existing scripts and existing automation, you can continue to use that. We are also going to be supporting managing Azure Stack HCI using System Center. So organizations who have already invested in System Center Operations Manager or System Center Virtual Machine Manager uh, in the future versions of those products, they will have support for managing Azure Stack HCI. And even third-party products. We know that popular monitoring and popular backup products are critical to how customers run their IT estate. And if you back up everything, for example, with Altaro, then you should be able to back up your HCI with Altaro. And so I'm really pleased to announce that already Altaro has officially announced support for the Azure Stack HCI public preview. You can learn more about their award-winning products at altaro.com. And we're excited to share a roadmap of even more partnerships over the coming months as we build out a robust ecosystem so that you as a customer can continue to use the tools that you want to use to manage your infrastructure. After all, you're the admin, you're in control. So just to recap, because we've talked about so many different things, right? We've talked about the specialized new host operating system with new features like disaster recovery, faster storage spaces resync, and full stack updates. We've talked about delivering that as an Azure service with native integration with the Azure Resource Manager. There's no agent required. How you can manage it in the Azure portal, get support through Azure, pay for it through Azure, and even self-service virtual machines through Azure coming soon. And we've talked about some of the steps that we're taking even as we make these significant transformative changes to the product to ensure that it stays true to what was important from a management and operations perspective for IT, the ability to choose and customize the hardware, familiar edge local tools, including scripting with PowerShell, System Center, and a third-party ecosystem of products like Altaro Backup, so that you as the admin are in full control of how you choose to run your Azure Stack HCI. So that's a recap of some of the things that are new. It's an awful lot of news. As, as you know, obviously we've already almost run out of time. There's a lot of questions. I'm sorry we haven't had the chance to answer even more of them. Uh, but that's a quick recap. If folks are excited about this, I highly encourage you to check out the public preview. It's available today, right now. You can go try it. Go to azure.com slash HCI, and you can download the preview version of Azure Stack HCI version 20H2, which as the name implies, uh, will be coming out for real later this year. Now this evaluation copy is really just that, it's for evaluation. So there's no cost, there's also no support. And you can either use existing hardware like Karsten mentioned, or you can use virtual machines, whatever it is that helps you to try it out and give us feedback. We would love to hear from you um, as we continue to shape the future of Azure Stack HCI. If I may say in closing, it's a really exciting time. This is sort of the beginning of a new chapter for edge infrastructure and for on-premises products from Microsoft. Uh, obviously we're using the Azure brand. That's gonna take folks, I think, a little bit of time to get used to. But at the end of the day, this product, just like Azure Stack Hub and Azure Stack Edge, and actually many, many other products from Azure are fundamentally on-premises products. These are things that you run in your data center and we're really excited to get your feedback as we continue to evolve these products and to make them better for you. So hopefully you'll, you'll go check out the preview. Um, hopefully you'll go check out Karsten's webinar in a month where he'll do more demos and get more hands-on. And with that, Karsten, if there are any final questions, I think we can do maybe one more round of questions. <laughs> yes, but first, uh, please uh, uh, show your poll, poll you wanted to do. Uh, yeah, th there's some explanation I would have to give for it, so that's fine. We can we can do it. We can pick it up another time. Okay. So I have lots of questions uh, still here. So you see, the the people are very excited slash concerned mm -hmm. slash um, uh, there is a lot of buzz about this. Um, so one question was from my friend Didier. He wanted to he asked which uh, backup vendors are supported. You mentioned Altaro. Are there others who already announced uh, the support of Azure Stack HCI, the public preview? I don't think so, but there are 
there are many others that we are working with. Altaro is the only one who has officially announced. Uh, you can go over, they have a blog. Uh, there's a blog that they published on altaro.com where they describe not only actually their support, they actually have a special deal as well. Yeah. Um, for customers who want to use uh, this new Azure Stack HCI. We're working with many of the other ones. Whoever it is that you have in mind, DDA, we're probably talking with them. Um, but we'll have more to share about that a little bit later this year. Okay, then you showed the uh, the, the self-service VMs or the VMs from mm -hmm. Azure. Uh, there is also a lot of questions about them. Um, uh, how is the VM license if you deploy it from Azure? Is it uh, with the Azure uh, license or do you have a separate license for that or do you have to uh, add your own licensing to that? Uh, that's a really great question. So if the virtual machine uh, is running open source software, of course, then th this question is moot. But I think uh, the reason that someone's asking this question is assuming that there is something like Windows mm. that is uh, billable to Microsoft. And so in the initial version, uh, you have to handle the guest applications and guest operating system licensing separate from HCI. Uh, but in the long run, we absolutely intend to make that seamless to pay for as well through Azure. So that's where we want to go. But in the first version, I think you'll have to bring your own license. But uh, to clarify that, Azure Stack HCI, you said it, is, is the infrastructure that is running on your premises, but it doesn't include any operating system licenses for virtual machines. So you uh, have to add them to, to the solution. But here are the questions. Can they still use their, uh, their already, um, how, they how they license it uh, now? So if they have Windows Server Data Center, can they add Windows Server Data Center to that solution? Can they use the SPLA licensing? That's important for service providers that they can add SPLA licensing. Uh, and so on. So can you clarify a bit about that? Yeah, the service provider's question is more complicated. I can answer the mainstream case, which is the enterprise, I have a Windows data center license, can I use that? Or standard, the answer for to example. that is yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the answer to that is yes. So if you have existing licenses for Windows Server 2019, for example, and you want to either bring a standard license for a couple of VMs or a data center license for many, many VMs, then yes, you can apply that to the host. Um, it's a little bit similar to how you would do that if you were running VMware, right? You would pay data center for the host and then you would have unlimited Windows VMs on top. Um, we are working on something that we haven't showed yet to make it even more convenient to be able to do that uh, because we know customers love inherited activation. They love automatic VM activation or AVMA. Um, so we're working on that. We'll have more to share about that a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, if you have an existing data center or a standard license, you can bring that. Yeah. The service provider license agreement question is a little bit more complicated because it gets into the availability of Azure Stack HCI for hosting. Uh, Azure Stack HCI is really not designed for that from the ground up. I mean, it, it can only exist in the context of one subscription at a time, and it doesn't do chargeback on a per VM basis or anything like that. Um, so our positioning is really not going to be geared at hosters right away. Um, and there was there's a question that I've gotten a number of times, so I'll just sort of jump ahead and answer it, which is, is HCI itself available in SPLA? And there are uh, no Azure Cloud services that are available in SPLA today. So all Azure Cloud services are available typically in three channels. They're available through an enterprise agreement if you have a subscription through your business. They're available through what we call Azure Direct, which is if you just go to azure.com and sign up. And then they're available through Cloud Solutions Provider or CSP licensing. Yeah. And Azure Stack HCI, the, the infrastructure subscription, is going to work just like all those other Azure services. So it'll be available in those three channels. I think the, the hosters, but uh, they can send me a mail or you a mail about that. I think they just want to uh, have Azure Stack HCI over the Azure services and then put SPLA Windows licensing per core on top of it to resell it. But there, it's always complex, so there have to be some clarification about that. And you can't, I think you are not the right person to ask about that because it's a deeply licensed question. Yeah, and our licensing team is aware of some of these questions. So they're, they're working on a uh, licensing paper that hopefully will describe all of these different combinations. Because you're right, Karsten, there's a lot of different combinations and moving parts and some of it depends on geography as well yeah. so i know <laughs> uh, yeah def, def, definitely you'll quickly hit the limit of what i understand about this and our licensing team will know the yeah. full answer 
Another question was, and I think it's answered, Johannes. Uh, yes, you can manage uh, Azure Stack HCI with a System Center Virtual Machine Manager, but later System Center Virtual Machine Manager has to get some updates for Azure Stack HCI. And I think they are pl planned in one of the f future URs. Right, Cosmos? Yes, that's correct. Okay, then there is then there, some people complain about the price, and I know uh, I, I I know that. Um, so they say ten dollars a month per core is not cheap if you have to add Windows licensing on top, um, and I I think uh, that's for bigger installations that's really a problem. But uh, something you didn't mention, and I want to do that um, if you. If you host Linux VMs on uh, on storage spaces direct, you have always to buy the data center license with Windows HCI. You have to buy the data center license to run uh, to run storage spaces direct. Here we have now a solution. If you go for Linux, where it is cheaper, I think, than uh, buying Windows Server data center licensing. Uh, for the host, especially, uh, I think it's cheaper. And also, if you do maybe VDI, so uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. So I think there is a use case. If you put Windows Server on top of it, there is there is an additional cost, of course, because with Storage Basis Direct, you have already. Uh, so with Windows Data Center, um, you have already Storage Basis Direct and all the Windows licensing. Um, so I think a lot of people care a bit about the price. Yeah, and I think that's reasonable. And I would encourage anyone who's who's interested in in sort of doing a comparison between the Azure Stack HCI pricing and the VMware pricing to actually go ahead and, and do that comparison because Azure Stack HCI um, includes essentially uh, all the features of something like vSphere standard, as well as all the features of vSAN at least, at least standard, probably more like vSAN advanced. Um, as well as, of course, SDN, which means NSX, as well as all the management that you're going to need for it, right? So Windows Admin Center and the Azure-based management tools um, are all part of this Azure Stack HCI price. And so I, I would really encourage folks who are who are interested in doing a total cost analysis to go ahead and make that comparison against the equivalent from another vendor like VMware. I think what you'll find is, especially when you add hardware, right, which is the same on both sides, support where the VMware support is pretty expensive. And then yes, Windows licensing or any other licensing, whether it's Oracle or SQL or whatever it is that you plan to run on top, that's also the same on both sides, right? If you do that full comparison, I think you'll find Azure Stack HCI is a very, very compelling value proposition in terms of what you get for the money. Yeah, and, and you have included all the updates because it's a subscription model, so you have the right to always have the newest version. With data center in Windows HCI, you have to have, um, to, have to get the same, you have to have the, uh, how it's called, <laughs> I even forgot the name. <laughs> uh, oh, you're thinking of software assurance. Software assurance, uh, yes. Okay, but there is a lot of questions about licensing, but I want to go over to other technical questions we couldn't answer. So one one very important question to myself is, are AMD CPUs, is there support for AMD CPUs for Azure Stack HCI? And to extend it, nested virtualization in the moment is not possible with AMD CPUs, only with Intel CPUs. So I would like to extend it, is it uh, I know you have AMD support, but also the nested stuff. Is it coming? Do you know something about that? Uh, yeah, so certainly the Azure Stack HCI OS supports AMD's latest CPUs. We've been collaborating closely with AMD to make sure that their latest Gen 2 Epic uh, works great with Azure Stack HCI. Um, we have them actually as one of our, our uh, very close partners in our hardware validation program. So we work with them every week. Uh, we are uh, always working to support the latest silicon features from both Intel and AMD. Uh, and so over the coming months and years, as new hardware capabilities are added into the new versions of the processors, we will support those capabilities with Azure Stack HCI. In many cases, this will be the first operating system to support those features. Um, but I don't have a specific promise around nested virtualization that I can make. Okay. Um... One uh, attendee is asking about the white paper for licensing. Have you a time frame when it would be available? I think at least when the product is out, so this year, but uh, anything sooner? 
Uh, yeah, what you said is what I would have said as well. Okay. So uh, it's actually a Microsoft requirement that we have that uh, paper available when we GA. And so you can count on it being sometime this year, uh, but I don't have a specific date. Okay, I, lo I look to the questions if I forgot something, but uh, I think I have covered most of them. Let's still have a short look. Yeah, I think most of them are covered and um, maybe uh, Cosmos uh, offered after Ignite uh, to do another webinar with us. And uh, uh, if you have questions about that are not answered, that I overlooked, please mail them to me and I uh, uh, mail them to Cosmos and maybe Cosmos have time to answer them or we do another a webinar later. So I, I don't want to extend your time too much because it's already after uh, 12 o'clock and you have to work tomorrow because uh, tomorrow or today is Friday, but you have to sleep a bit. So I'm uh, so I, I will give you the chance to do the poll. We have still 113 uh, attendees live. So please stay another two to three minutes or five minutes, Cosmos, if you want to do that, because I think it's important. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. So um, one of the things that we are always doing um, with Azure Stack HCI is continuing to invest in the little things, right? Now, there was a lot of emphasis in the presentation earlier today on uh, hybrid functionality with Azure and sort of these big transformative changes that we're making to the overall Azure Stack HCI product. Uh, but there's lots of little things that the team is working on as well. And I wanted to shine a light on one of those little things, if I may. Now, in recent years, because of uh, both Windows Admin Center as well as the amazing ecosystem of partner extensions for Windows Admin Center, it's become increasingly common for customers to manage Azure Stack HCI remotely almost all the time. Uh, the number of scenarios for actually logging in interactively into an HCI host is really becoming kind of a short list. And so our design team was thinking, you know, when someone does log in to Azure Stack HCI and they have tasks that they need to perform, what are those tasks and what would the ideal experience for those tasks actually look like? And we can think of a few examples, whether it's configuring IP addresses or enabling remote management or adding a user as a local admin or joining Active Directory. These are all very good reasons that you would actually log into a machine and do it directly because it can be kind of tricky to bootstrap these things from remote management. Now, if we think about designing the ideal user experience for when you actually log in directly to an HCI host, on the one hand, we could do like server core, right? Which is just a, an empty blinking command window, but that's kind of, that's kind of impo intimidating, right? Because there's not really any obvious options. It's very hard even to know how to do basic tasks. On the other end, we could make it look like a full classic Windows, like just like your laptop, right? Um, but for HCI, that's actually not great either because then there's thousands of options and most of them are not relevant for HCI. Like the wizard to set up a webcam is not something that you need on your HCI host, right? So it's kind of not ideal either. And so what our team has been wondering is, is there a sweet spot somewhere in the middle where we can deliver a, a, an inbox shell experience that is helpful, but that is also simple and that is focused on helping you to very quickly get in, do the configuration you need, and then get out again. Now, uh, the team is working on lots of different design concepts. I have some sort of early screenshots here from some of the things that they're thinking through, you know, how do you configure uh, all of the network adapters in a very clear intuitive screen? Um, how can we make it so that even if it's uh, text-based so that the inputs are very clear, like what, what inputs are we expecting? Uh, how can we do things like error handling, again, even if it's text-based? So there's lots of very interesting design thinking going on on the team. Uh, and what, you, what you'll see if you use the public preview of Azure Stack HCI that we talked about is by default, when you actually log in, what pops up is this sort of helpful menu that says, welcome to Azure Stack HCI, and it presents you with a couple of options. Now, this looks and feels exactly like a tool that you may be familiar with from the past called sconfig or server config. Um, and you might not believe me, but it's actually true that this was completely rewritten from scratch in the last six months for Azure Stack HCI. Now, to start, we rewrote it so that it looks just like sconfig, but going forward, we're very interested in evolving this to make it even better based on feedback. So if you're following very, very closely, uh, this month, the, the public preview actually changed, so the formatting on certain screens improved significantly. 
from what you see on the left here over to what you see on the right. And the thing I wanted to ask about is the team is currently uh, debating whether we should reorganize the way that the options are on the home screen. So today the options are in this numbered list that is the same ordering of the options as in sconfig. Um, but we are exploring instead reorganizing the list and grouping them under headings. So for example, all of the options related to identity would be you know, grouped one, two, three. All of the options related to remote management and remote access would be grouped four, five, six, seven, and so on. Um, now there's some upsides and some downsides. Uh, if you had uh, memorized any of the options from sconfig before, then we would be changing the order of them, right? So that's kind of a, a break from a consistency perspective. Uh, but there's also potentially some some advantages. So I have a very quick survey designed really to uh, sort of ask which of these two options uh, folks prefer. And if you have additional menu options that you think should be part of this screen. And this is, I think you can imagine, just the first of many little polls like this that we're going to be doing over the coming months and years as the team continues to refine this into making it the best default login screen that it can be. So Karsten, I have uh, a quick link here to that survey, which I'll share. Uh, it really is just a couple of short questions. And uh, we're very eager to hear what folks uh, think about uh, the design of this page. Yeah, there is a so chat I will window. put that into the chat window yeah. here. And that is the survey that I wanted to ask about. Um, question. So my, my, my mic was muted. Uh, question, did you receive uh, the attendees? Did you receive the, uh, the link from uh, Cosmos? No? Okay. No, no, no. Why not? I will, I will uh, post it again. Did you receive it now? Yes. Okay. So um, um, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Please, uh, please, please do this survey and uh, put in your additional uh, requests. I have already two in mind. <laughs> so uh, Cosmos, uh, <laughs> um, uh, installing drivers and setting VLAN, uh, VLAN IDs are some of mine, but I have to think about it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Terrific. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly the feedback we're looking yeah, for. Yeah, because I have I have problems here uh, with uh, with my I have all VLANs on everything in my environment, and it's quite hard to do it on the console. And you have to do that before you can connect to to uh, the the console uh, or to the Azure Stack HCI remotely. So uh, with that, please do the survey. I I would I would love to thank or I, I like to thank uh, Cosmos for the late presentation for him. I think you agree that was a great one and especially the questions were also uh, fantastic that you answered a lot of them. Uh, so um, <laughs> I, I thank you and I would like to, uh, you to go to sleep and all the others uh, hope that was uh, informative for you and I can't wait to do more webinars about um, Azure Stack HCI. I know there are two options and you don't have to all choose a new one of course uh, cosmos would like that but uh, what we have so far is also great and uh, i can't wait to see ignite where you maybe announce some new things yep we have we have some pretty exciting announcements lined up for microsoft ignite one in particular that i think uh, customers are going to find really really valuable so definitely stay tuned for ignite that'll be just a month from today and karsten Thank you so much for organizing this and for having me. I hope we get to do this again very I soon. I hope I hope the same. So thank you, Cosmos, and thanks for all the attendees. I will I will post the recording uh, this weekend. I hope uh, and uh, see you soon, guys. Bye.